Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here. For those of you who have not joined us yet for any of our art series with Miha, um, this is our third class. Correct me if I know. Yes, this is our third class. I'm trying to think we've been having you for a few months now. Yeah. Um, so we're super excited to have Miha back with us. Miha is a UW graduate and a visual artist local in Seattle. He has lots of experience across different mediums. And today we're going to be doing some comic drawing. Um, whether you are new to comics or you love comics, you've drawn before, you just like reading them. Um, there'll be a little bit of an intro and overview for everyone here. So Miha, I'm going to go ahead and let you take it away. Um, and we will have one more next month. So more information on that to come at the end of class today. Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's I'm really excited to be back, particularly because we're going to get to talk about comics. And I, I really <laughs> like comics. I've, I grew up on it. Um, so the way I kind of had it set up is I'm gonna we'll do like a little brief um, historical overview just you know, in just a small amount to kind of give you an understanding of it. They will talk a couple of different approaches to it, um, some materials, and then I got some demos um, lined up for you. So, you know, one of my favorite comic book writers is a guy by the name of Graham Morrison. And he says, Not, um, only nothing is impossible. And that's like, when you think about comics, that's true. When it comes to comics, they're not bound by regular constraints of our physics of this universe. So you can really do your imagination really is your limitation and you can take it anywhere you want. If you want to do comics on the walls, I mean, I wouldn't try it, but you can, you can do all sorts of exciting things. And so I grew up on comics, particularly on very sort of um, heroic male superhero centric comics, as you can imagine, that were floating around in the seventies. And the artists that really influenced me sort of more than others was this guy by the name of John Bushima. And he really, there was something about his physicality that read so real to me. Um, you know, when you look at his proportions, his anatomy, his, how alive these images were, I, I really never understood how this wasn't fine art. And so naturally I wanted to grow up being an illustrator to do comics. And I, I kind of quickly learned that there was this weird, um, division in the arts and the comic book artists weren't thought of as even artists for a long time they were kind of thought of these you know illustrators they were sort of hired uh like mercenaries um but i mean some of these works that you look are absolutely extraordinary you know the, the amount of detail and, and passion that went into these pages was just it, to me, really, uh, really stood out as something incredible and something worth doing. So when I started making my own work, it really, from the very beginning, it was it was in, uh, really sort of informed by the clean lines and 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 the the, the beauty of the contrast of ink versus a blank page. And then I even took that to the painting. So when I would do paintings, they would kind of have very much similar um, effect, as though they were just enormous comics on canvas. Uh, and, you know, I, I continue doing that into today. Um, as a matter of fact, I just um, installed the show uh, last weekend, which really, again, returns back to that my original love for the comics um, and the, the kind of, uh, you know, graphic layout. Um, so, by the way, for those of you that might be interested, there's an artist talk next Saturday, or no, this Saturday uh, at one. So if you're interested, just go to Shift Gallery uh, and follow their link. Now, in terms of history of comics, uh, let's just kind of break down some myths just to kind of give you a better understanding of it. Comics have been around for a very long time. And usually the, the term that, that has been coined to describe comics to kind of elevate it a little bit is called sequential art. And that is to suggest that there's an, organize, there's an organization of images in order to sort of um, propel further the narrative, the storytelling. And unlike fine art, where you have one image that is often sort of captured and frozen in time with comics, you have to continue telling the story. So you have to be very good at depiction of, of figuration, right? Like something like that. But you also have to be a good storyteller because from panel to panel, which is what these little 
squares are called, you might lose your audience. If, if you put in a panel that's not that exciting, people might just move on. Um, and the, the really the, some of the oldest examples of what could be considered sequential art goes back to like the um, Egyptian hieroglyphs, for example, Greco-Roman, uh, some of the friezes, so the, so the designs in the art uh, sculpture would, would be in a way considered these um, sequential art or like sort of proto comics, if you will, um, as well as manuscript illumination, right? Um, that monks would uh, kind of toil away at, at making little designs and little doodles in, in, in the pages of the manuscripts. So very long uh, and illustrious career, but as I said, it, or um, of the medium history, but as I said, it sort of kind of always was seen as this, you know, the unwanted child of the arts. And I think it's also because they were sort of seen as a lesser uh, medium. They weren't seen as elevated or as philosophical as painting, for example, uh, which has changed quite a bit recently. I mean, uh, any of you that might be interested in comics right now is a great time to get into it because I don't think comics have ever been hotter than they are right now. You know, you can really uh, tell any sorts of stories. Well, this is some of the first. Um, so we would have them from the from the um, the end of the 19th century. And what you can see is these aren't traditional kind of comics as we know. There, there are no word balloons here, right? There are there is narrative, meaning there's a story that you follow from panel to panel, but it's structured or designed in a different way than what we are generally used to. Uh, and then in, in, in the US, uh, we'll have people like Disney and Windsor McKay with his Little Nemo in Slumberland. We got, uh, we got Crazy Cat. So, you know, you have stuff like this um, to where now there are panels, but each panel within it is telling a more complex story that then relies on a consecutive panel. And so you follow the pages. And by following the pages, it tells a one grander story. Um, this is also where things get quite complicated because you have to have your concept really well laid out. Otherwise, you know, things could shift from, well, even little things like how far is Lil Nemo going to climb in three panels? Well, do we put him, you know, a story down or three stories down or four stories down? Is there going to be 15 panels? I mean, all these intricate details are often constructed and designed or um, informed by the writer and the, the, the cartoonist. Sometimes that could be the same person as in, in, him, uh, in case of Crazy Cat here that we see. So then after that, we go into what is known as when the first comics come in, and that's in, in the form of the reproduction that we know today as a comic strip collected in an album, it's this, right? So this is around 1935. These comics aren't particularly intricate or, or really uh, you know, high art, but what they are is they're cheap to re reproduce because they're all done on uh, newsprint or uh, you know, what we use for drawing. So, it's not archival and that affects the colors. You can see this one has begun to fade because it's really, really old. Um, but the first kind of comic that kind of makes a big difference is in 1938. And that is when the golden age begins. And it's generally attributed to this comic right here. This is action comics number one. And it is the introduction of the ultimate superhero. I mean, it's Superman. He, he, there, there's literally nothing Superman can do. Um, and it's so fantastic to think that the first kind of superhero that comes out really claims all the superpowers. I mean, after that, where are you going to go? He can do it all. A few years later, there is a, 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 a follow-up by Bob Kane and Bill Finger, and that is Batman with Detective Comics. Now, these two comics would go on to jumpstart an industry as we know today. I mean, they are one of the hottest properties franchises in the world. Uh, you know, we're talking about billions of dollars that that these designs bring in. Just think about Superman on, on, 
juice boxes on 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 you know food on everywhere pajamas belts shirts everywhere the property the licensing property is extremely lucrative which is also the dark side of comics which is that these early creators had no claim to the characters that they created so in case of schuster and 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 siegel um who were the creators of superman you know they would for years try to get the property back but unfortunately they they just couldn't anyways that's what we call the golden age of comics then the golden age kind of hits it's uh you know uh, right after the war people aren't that much into superheroes and the next leap that comes forth is sort of romance comics western comics uh and and um uh, military comics now this is generally known as the atomic age of comics um, and the primary example of this period is the entertainment comics or simply known as the ec comics now ec comics are really into suspense horror science fiction like all the things that young uh, growing minds need um, and in fact, uh, I do have to warn you, the next cover is going to be a, a bit of a shocker, but it, I have to include it because it's such a seminal work. And that is this cover. It's the Crime Suspense Stories 22. And I'm going to skip to it. Um, and it, it's so shocking that it actually starts uh, the, the Senate hearings about uh, the correlation between comics and juvenile delinquency in 1954. That comic brings down the industry, so to speak, because shortly after that, there's a publication of a book called Seduction of the Innocent, in which um, uh, Wertheim claims that there's a, there's a strong correlation between the violent comics and children's propensity to act out. So naturally, what the, the, the Senate hearings sort of impose, and officially, is a self-regulation within the comic book industry. And that is known as the, the uh, Comics Code Authority. And so no comic could get sold in the US without this stamp. As you see, these don't have the stamp yet because that's a pre-code comics. After this, all comics that were sold on newsstands had to carry the stamp or they couldn't be sold. So this really changed the game and ushered in the Silver Age which is characterized by a revival of um, some uh, characters like the Flash, but most notably by uh, the fact that DC, uh, which has all the big heroes, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, you name it, had a competition in a timely magazine, also known as Marvel Comics. Now, there will be two people in particular, uh, Stanley and Jack Kirby, they will sort of single-handedly, you know, start all of the major characters that we know from Fantastic Four in 1961, which is known as Marvel's first family, to Spider-Man in 1962. Uh, this one is a collaboration with Steve Ditko, uh, to X-Men in 1963, uh, once more Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Uh, Jack Kirby helps create uh, um, Captain America, Hulk, Thor, all of the characters that we sort of know and love. Uh, and the Silver Age ends in 70 when Jack Kirby leaves to, uh, to work for, its comp for Marvel's competition, which is DC. And after that, we sort of have the Bronze Age, which is when younger artists, now former fans of the comics, take over the industry right now become they become writers they become the creators so the storytelling gets really wonderfully um adult and it's no more silly stories of superman switching bodies with some kind of you know freaky demon from another planet it, it, these are more socio-politically engaging stories stuff uh you know um stories by green lantern and 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 the uh, green arrow when they go walk around America and they confront things like race, racial injustice or, or uh, you know, all sorts of, or feminism, like really cool things. Um, so, and the last thing to note is that in the, in, uh, and then what happens is that in the 80s, 
a new thing develops and that's direct market. The direct market now allows stores to spring up, which actually only focus on selling comics. And this really kind of changes the game because if you have a direct distribution, you no longer need to worry about the comics code, right? Um, so pretty soon the comics code gets dropped and comics start to take a much more adult turn. In fact, this is when we start to talk about the, the graphic novels versus just comics. And a lot has to do with that, uh, with the British invasion in 86, which is um, a slew of British artists who as fans growing up on American comics now start writing for American publications. We got Alan Moore doing Marvel Man. Um, he's doing uh, uh, Watchmen. He does V for Vendetta. I mean, from I mean, you name it. He uh, uh, Alan Moore was all over like all the major titles that have now been turned into franchises and films and stuff like that. Um, and we have people like Frank Miller starting to do The Dark Knight Returns. And what so what they're focusing on is now imagine for decades they grew up reading comics and now they begin to deconstruct the mythology of comics. And this is really a, a, a fantastic um, kind of revolution of the comics and the evolution into what we call graphic novels. So as you can imagine, as, as you've seen, there are different types of comics. You can have like this, where you just have panels with text below it. Um, you can have, you know, stories that involve um, animals. You can have um, simplified, more cartoony styles. You can have um, exaggerated, simplified features. Um, um, you can have a, a much more um, simple page outline where you just have two panels per page. Um, so again, only what you are kind of limited by your imagination, that is the only limitation. Um, so we can, what we're going to do today is we'll be uh, looking at just some simple process and ideas and how to kind of maybe flush some of those out. But the first thing that I want to address is the materials and the supplies, because this is one of the questions that's most, most often asked and because I, I don't want you to spend a ton of uh, money getting started because there's a lot of sort of places out there that'll tell you like all sorts of things that you need which you may not actually really need. Um, so I would say what you're going to use what you want to use is one pad of sketch sketching paper or just a simple paper from the printer right this is the kind of cheap thin paper that you're going to use for your sketching out for your thumbnails and sort of just kind of laying out the designs. Like, so I'll show you here a quick page. Like this is just a print up page of, I don't even know what's on the other side, probably a list of something. But this kind of gives me just an idea of how I want to lay out the page, right? And that way I don't have to use my fancy paper to, to, to play around with that because, you know, it's, it's cheap paper. It's just <laughs> a print up. So that's the one thing I would suggest you have. And then the second thing which you're going to want to use is a Bristol pad. Now, a Bristol board is a softer, smoother, more durable paper. Uh, and the reason you want to use that is because a lot, so it often looks like this and it'll come in a variety of sizes. But the reason you want to use this one for your drawings is if you're going to use any kind of wet medium or ink or even the fact that on this kind of paper, if you start trying to erase it too much, it will begin to tear your page. But with a Bristol board, it's much easier to kind of, um, you know, do any kind of fix, fix up that you need to do uh, with, with both um, in ter terms of ink and as well as in terms of just trying to remove your pencil marks. Pencils, you know, I, I would say get an HB pen, a 4B and a 2H, that way you have a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a variety. Mechanical pencils um, are great for sort of detailed work. So stuff like this, where you can just kind of begin to take out that lead point and, and use it for a small detailed pages. And then the other is color pencil. Now, the color pencil is something that I would say 
is a really great tool to have. Now, in this page I, um, that I have laid out here, you can see, hopefully, that there was a, a, a brief drawing that was done in graphite, but there's one over that that's done in what looks like a red pencil. Now, these color pencils, these are not like colored colors, right? Like Prisma colors and stuff like that. These are actually what they used to use um, for, because it's non-photo paper, meaning back in the day, what they would do is an artist would lay down the pages in pencil, and then they, they would send them to the inker, which often was not the same person. And the reason you would wanna have these um, marks is so the inker could see what they need to ink, but these were non-Xerox, um, non-Xerox um, pencils, right? So when you actually do, did a scan of it, the pages, the, the, the drawing wouldn't show up. So it's a really kind of cool way to, to use, um, to kind of lay down your original design without sort of ruining your page. Um, and then erasers. Um, now, I'll just talk briefly about ink. Um, inks you can either use in a bottle, so like a speedball here, which you can just pour into, you know, get yourself like some, uh, this was actually originally for those little egg decorations, you know, for like uh, Easter or something. <laughs> I just bought it in like a $1 shop. Um, and then you, you get ink. Now, if you're going to use ink from the bottle, what you will probably want to be using, which we're going to do today, is a brush. Right, so you want to have a brush, uh, a smaller brush, and then perhaps a larger brush to help you cover uh, more of an area. Of course, if if you're sort of limited on space or 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 you don't want to be messing around with ink because you don't want to spill that, there's also the option of just using ink pens. Ink pens are a wonderful alternative to to um, inks because they have that archival quality. So you can get Micron pens or Faber-Castell. It's really depending on your preference. The only thing worth remembering when it comes to the um, ink pens is that they, the, the great thing about them is you can go over with um, water if you wanna do ink washes and it won't let it bleed. So actually, you know what? Why don't we do like a little um, demo here? I'll show you. So. I sometimes love to use just uh, old fashioned fountain pen. So, okay, we got like a little design laid out here. Um, so let's say, okay, we could do a uh, quick little ink drawing. And what, what I'm using right now is just a ink wad. Uh, uh, it's a fountain pen, but you can also use a marker, right? Marker won't bleed if you put water over it. So how do we'll do like a really creepy Batman? Ho hopefully um, DC doesn't hit us up for using their property. But okay, so now we got that, and let me show you what I was talking about with the ink washes. Ink wash is when you dilute, dilute your ink with water, and it will create a bit of a bleed or blooming you see that sort of creates like a nice little articulation uh if you want to kind of create a sense of some shadows and uh, and um, modeling of the figure so boom we got that going but you see how i'm going right here where the marker was and nothing happens that's because that's a permanent marker so we don't have to worry about that bleeding now on the other hand now we got our design, we can actually use um, an ink pen, an actual old school pen. And what I like to do is I like to just fill up a separate container um, because these inks are really difficult to pour uh, because the tops will all get all kind of, you know, dry at the top and then they just get really difficult to maneuver. Um, but you don't want to spill it. So look at that with that nice, rich India ink. Look at how beautifully 
um, deep those sh that contrast is. This is what I love about comics. They're just so, can be so extraordinary to mess around with. Um, so let's um, put him like some really creepy looking teeth on this Batman. I don't know, I, I would imagine like Batman is fighting crime. So maybe his, one of his teeth might be a little like chip right here. Although he's got all the money in the world, but still. Okay, we got that. And look at, look at how, how rich that, that ink gets. Just really, really beautiful. Now, um, gonna let that dry for a second. That's, that's one of the things that you also unfortunately have to keep in mind if you're using ink with a brush um, is that the ink needs to, to dry, otherwise it'll bleed and, and we don't want that. In which case, the other thing you can use is this. Uh, and this is an old school pen with a, you know, just a standard nib. And let me show you that. This is for your really wonderful, tiny, precise detail. See that little element uh, right there? That, oops. I'm <laughs> trying to manage this camera and the other camera. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, but look at that. You can really kind of um, get in there and it will. Okay, so that is using a, uh, a, a quill pen. And then now the other option is I'm going to be doing it right here in the chin. I'll be using a, uh, a, 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 a an ink pen, like a micron pen. So be some cross hatching right there. And these pens, the cool thing about them is that they come in variety of sizes. So you can really, um, you can really vary up your line quality and it and you can kind of create that wonderful kind of um variety of cross hatching uh cross hatching is one of those old school ways of of making comics feel nice and three-dimensional uh like they have volume you know um if you get into comics there's some really extraordinary artists that um were just the masters of of, of cross hatching so I'm gonna wait for that to dry for a second. And I wanted to um, show you a couple of other things. Um, and that's in terms of um, for if you make mistakes, so your editing tools, um, there are a couple of things that you can use. Now, I tend to just really love to use a whiteout, right? The problem with whiteout is that it dries fairly kind of chunky and thick. so. If you, if you put it on a page, it'll really kind of stand out. So the other option is that you can get these, um, this is like a Japanese white out, uh, kind of almost like white paint that you can then use a brush to just simply fix your uh, mistakes with. Uh, and you know, th uh, those happen all the time. So th don't, don't be too, too worried if you, if you uh, make a mistake. Now, Let's talk about the process for a second. The most important thing, and really the only thing that matters in the, in the long run is your idea. Um, if you have a cool idea, the rest will just fall into place. Um, so once you have an idea, let's say, oh, I, I wanna do a story about, you know, two siblings who go on an adventure or something, and then flush out that plot, you know, what is gonna make it compelling for the viewer to, to or the viewer, the reader, to follow along. But once you have these things for your characters, because remember, unlike with painting where you, for example, oh yeah, you're gonna paint 
I don't know, George Washington. You only have to paint George Washington from one angle once. With comics, you have to imagine what is it actually that character looks like in the round. Like you have to have a three-dimensional concept of that each character, like the design for them. And so these are really extraordinary drawings, but one of my favorite um, artists, Frank Quietly. And what you see right here is these quick, um, quick little pencil sketches. But look at what he's trying to do, right? We all know that Superman's alter ego is Clark Kent. And, you know, one of those old jokes is how does nobody know that Superman is Clark Kent? It's basically the same guy. But look at what Frank quietly did. He's actually thinking about the psychology of this, right? So he's saying, well, maybe they don't think that it's him because Clark Kent walks slumped over. He looks kind of pouchy. He's got the glasses on. So the physical property of this character is altered. And that's such a brilliant little take on it, right? Um, and so, and there's that blue pencil that we were talking about. You would use the blue pencil to really kind of work out your underdrawing where you're not too worried about making a mistake. And then you come over with either your, I think that he's working straight with um, just graphite over it, uh, but it could be an ink. Um, either way, it, you can see like, it's not as precise as one might think it is even here, right? You can see the blue pencil underneath the graphite line. And it's to help him really kind of flush out this three-dimensionality of the character, making it feel really like it has volume, like it has, you know, some mass property. Um, now here, what I often do myself is I'll have that separate piece of paper that I was telling you about, the kind of more of a, you know, cheapo printing paper, where I kind of lay out the sequence of how the page will be laid out. And then I start my page layout with, with the blue pencil, as you can see below it. And then I came over with graphite, so a regular pencil. And now I'm laying ink over that, right? So you, you can kind of see it progress. Um, even here is another example of a Batman page. You can see where the pencil marks are. And you can see the artist already laying over the ink, right? Uh, these are just extraordinary pages. Uh, I, I just love these. So, uh, and then after you do the lettering. Now, the reason you want to figure out this stage, your page layout, is because most people do the lettering that's not digital, meaning that you have to actually accommodate the space for your text. So, and the last thing you want to do is do like a really beautiful drawing of something and then realize, oh my gosh, I'm gonna cover half of that image with text. That would make no sense. So, or at least it would sort of defeat the purpose. So what you wanna do is that's why you wanna do this page layout that really kind of lets you know right away, oh yeah, this is all accommodate for the, uh, for the text. This will accommodate the text. Um, so these are the things to kind of keep in mind, right? So we got the layout, we got the inked page, and then we have a cleanup page, meaning uh, it's been scanned, uh, the, the contrast has been adjusted, and the text has been added. And you can see right there that already in the original page layout, it was meant to accommodate where the text would go, right? So none of the cool images that we spend doing are now sort of covered by text. Um, and don't forget, you can also do things with um, in other approaches or digitally. For example, one of my uh, a, a really great artists used to work with us, uh, Philip Rodriguez, he would um, take Archie comics and then basically just cut out almost like a collage from other comics. Sometimes he would add his own little drawings. And then the text was randomly picked up from different soap operas. He's a huge soap opera fan. So what he would do is he would just apply it in a very kind of surrealistic process. Really fantastic. Or um, Ashley Ferguson here, who's my co-partner in the good, It's Good Comics uh, um, uh, 
you know, enterprise. Um, in, for this one, she actually got a book and cut up these pages and then drew over the pages and put it all together afterwards digitally. So there's plenty really, really interesting ways that you can go with the comics. Now, because I know that this, uh, you know, following can sometimes get following along, uh, depending on, on the view can get a little tricky. Before we continue this little Batman uh, drawing, I, I put together a little demo for you, just to kind of give you a sense of from the rough layouts to the, to, to the ink and then to the color. So here you go. So these are thumbnails to give us a sense of layout, right? And now we start laying down the inks. Be, be, be cautious that uh, you don't smudge, you know, because ink takes a while to dry. So even with, even with micron pens, actually. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're working in a way that you don't run your hand over the uh, finished or just recently finished page because that might uh, smudge your, your um, ink line. So this one was pretty, uh, a very loose layout, um, just enough to kind of give me a sense of a quick little silly design. And as you see, I, I use uh, micron pens and I often use a uh, fountain pen just because it's easier than a cleanup with uh, a brush or even more with a, with a quill pen. But you can, you can take whatever is um, you uh, enjoy and then adding text and cleaning up any mistakes you might've made. And then you can also use something as simple as Photoshop to just add a bit of a variety in terms of color. Um, you know, even, even just doing that, you see how it engages the, the space a little bit more. So let's, uh, let's now, I think this Batman here has dried up a little bit. So you will go back into with an ink, with an ink, uh, pen. And so, um, See that side now is all dry here. So, but it's added like a nice little variety because of that ink wash that we had on, done earlier. Uh, so, got that. Okay. Now the ink, inks, you can get them in, in different colors. So um, if you want to um, color up some of your pages, you can use acrylic inks um, uh, or India inks that come in, in uh, also in red and all, all sorts of stuff. But what you can also do, and this is why it's good to use um, this um, Bristol board, is you can actually also use um, either watercolor or gouache, which is uh, which is op opaque watercolor, and it will give you really a nice uh, addition to your page, as, as well as simply scanning the page, and then using a uh, um, digital platform, um, you know, to help you. to help you incorporate some color variation. Well, let's put a little bubbles here, like he just got hit in the head and maybe he's a little woozy, which is maybe why he's got that chipped tooth. Okay, I'm gonna wait that for dry. I wanted to ask, are there perhaps any questions that I can answer? None so far popping in. There's just a few questions on if we if we're able to make your drawing larger. So I just removed your personal pin, just so you know. Okay. 
is, is just that, so we can see the drawing closer. Sure, sure. Is, is it, is that it made it closer, just so that it's not a split screen. Got you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Anne. I, I love to draw with, with, with ink. It's just so, it has this sense of energy and it's so freeing, you know. Um, of course, there's all, you're always running a risk of uh, making a mistake, but that's what makes it so exciting. You know, it's, uh, it's really rewarding when you kind of finish it and you knew that you were, <laughs> it's like you're driving without a drive. It's like driving without a driver's license and getting away with it. You're kind of like excited. <laughs> Uh, One question we just got. Yeah, so yeah. Workflow recommendations for using digital media after starting with pen and paper. Um, I I always do. I, I have used digital, but what I do is I do all of my um, layouts in in pencil on page, and then sometimes I'll or what I'll do is I'll scan that and then use something like. Um, I know that like a lot of artists now use Procreate. Um, my iPad, unfortunately, is very sort of old and antiquated, so it doesn't support that uh, platform. But um, I, I think it's a it's a great way to really do some exciting things, uh, but by by incorporating the digital elements. So um, if you have an opportunity for it, I say go for it. Um, and yeah, now the technology is. You know, making it really available. A lot of the comic book artists are all using um, digital. I let that dry for a second, and then let's do a little bit of a ink wash. It looks like Paripa. If you wanna, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hey, Paripa. Hey, Miha. How are um, you? I'm doing good. Um, thank you for the session. So I have a question. Um, yeah. What are some platforms that um, you recommend for connecting with other um, comic or web novel or graphic novel artists? That's that's a good question. I think that I, I still I still think that um, Instagram is quite active, um, but um, uh, a lot of artists um, and creators now use um, Patreon. I, I personally haven't uh, ventured into that, that realm yet, but a, a lot of artists are using that. Yeah, and that, that might be a good way to um, find um, somebody to collaborate with. Okay, sounds great, thank you. Yeah, of course. And Oliver asks if you can talk a little bit about layouts and texts. Yeah, so I think that, um, okay, one thing I'm going to tell you, this is like a, a, a secret that, oh, no, it's not really a secret, but one of the things I always do is when I start, um, when I actually have a layout and then I'm trying to, uh, when I start the page, I'll always start with the center first and I'll always start with one of the middle pages because I find that the very first pages that I make are always gonna be sort of like the weakest. And I don't want the very first page of the book to be like the weakest page. You wanna kind of like grab your, uh, you know, you wanna grab your um, reader with the very first page. So uh, that's why like, I, I don't know, it's just me. Like I, I tend to, to, to not put my best foot forward with the very first drawing. So. But what I would say is try to keep the text from being the, the ratio from overwhelming. If it's like so much text on a page, most of the time people will just sort of skip through it. So um, uh, I would say don't go too, too wild with too much text. Um, I, I've done that in the past and it, it never bodes well. Not to mention that it's really difficult to squeeze it on a page because you know, your drawings are going to be so small that it almost doesn't really, uh, you know, then you just, it's almost like a prose, just writing a novel. And there, um, there was another question, Anna, about the layouts. 
Yes, just uh, about how do you, it's just, can you talk about layouts? I'm guessing kind of, sure. how do you go about um, creating your layouts? and? Yeah, so and I design? usually kind of think of, of like, okay, so if this is a scene, almost like a movie, right? It's like a, it's like a, um, like storyboarding. You want to think about like, okay, what would be an exciting way to visually capture this exchange here? Uh, you know, um, and now you could, uh, it's kind of ironic saying like, you don't want to have a, 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 like the point of view or the camera on the character always the same because I just show you this page and that's exactly what's happening here, right? It's like the same, da, da, da. but this is, a, this is a, a different example, but you want to kind of vary, vary, vary it up a little bit, make it exciting for the viewer to see other kind of parts of this world that you're constructing, uh, which why the thumbnails are so important because they give you your first glance of what the page is going to look like. Uh, now, I know artists that were actually lay out the entire book in thumbnails first before they put down even a single, uh, you know, a single panel. Um, there's a great book on how The Watchmen was made by, by, um, by Dave Gibbons. And, you know, it's such a seminal work. And when you look in, in that book, the, the, making of, the Making of Watchmen, you can actually see his entire pages being laid out in this tiny little quick thumbnail doodles. But it gives, it gives them a really great understanding of how the flow of, of, of the content is gonna go, right? You don't have, generally in comics is they have something called a splash page. So a, a splash page would be where you have several pages that have smaller panels with the text and stuff. And then you'll have that one big kind of heroic page when you got like Superman just, you know, busting through the wall or something. That's usually called a splash page. Now, everybody loves to draw splash pages because they're super heroic and super kind of cool. But what you don't want to have is, is a book that's full of splash pages either, right? Because that gets, it gets <laughs> old pretty fast. So the same way that you don't want to have a ton of pages that are just kind of like talking heads, right? Just seeing heads move in text. You also don't want to have just a, a page after page of, of these splash pages. And a great example of that is, I don't know if there are any fans of the image comics from the nineties, but you know, Rob Liefeld and, and, and those, those guys in image, they came to the point with almost every page of a 22 book, a 22 page book was a splash page. Imagine how far that story gets. It gets nowhere, right? Because every page is just somebody like sort of like hello, hello, heroically busting on, on through a situation. So I would say kind of find a nice balance of text, action, emotion, and then add a bit of a act, uh, you know, kind of excitement to it. Those are the best kind of um, pages, at least to me. Uh, but again, again, that varies. And at the end of the day, I'm, it's not like I'm Jack Kirby or something. <laughs> are, are there any other questions? Those are the only questions. So Those are the only questions? All right. Well, I'm going to continue though, with this. Has, um... the, what was that? Oh, I said, we'll keep an eye out, though. If oh, sure. Thank you so well, much. Welcome All to right. raise hands, too. I'm going to get into this little um, weird little Batman. So. Yeah, I, I think that there's, uh, because of the technology nowadays, being as, as, as available as it is, you know, with, with digital, you can really, people do all sorts of comics. People do comics with watercolor. Uh, people do comics with uh, cut out newspapers. They self print, uh, they self publish. Um, those are all your options. Um, really the only, Really, there's nothing else you need but passion. Seriously, like that will take you across the finish line. Um, everything else, it's it's uh, you you can you fake it until you make it. Um, but the passion is is the thing that's certainly going to keep readers coming back. Or um, and then you know, um, as I said, right now is really a wonderful. Uh, wonderful opportunity and and desire and need 
for these um, for this form for this medium so if you have a cool story you think you have a story that others might be interested in reading and, I, and i'm sure you do because every person has like a something exciting you know you can start by using elements from your own life um, that's always a, a good place to begin um, there's a lot of indie comics nowadays there's a lot of alternative comics there's a lot of um, venues where you can get alternative comics because of the self-publishing um, and Piscor is doing some really cool stuff um, the Fantagraphics here in Seattle are, are publishing really wonderful content so yeah and Anne asks that you you've mentioned John Buscema as an influence who are some other artists who have inspired you um, so yeah, John, John Buscema was definitely the artist that I, I, I loved growing up because um, his, his work was just so iconic. But right now uh, there's, there's a artist out of, I think he lives in Portland, if I'm not mistaken. His name is uh, Brandon Graham, who does his own stories uh, as well as all his own illustrations and uses his own, uh, uh, he does his own colors. Uh, really fantastic, uh, fantastic artist. Uh, Casey Silver is a local writer, uh, does really um, great comics too. Um, Frank Quietly, who, who we saw earlier with that um, Superman sketch, he's probably like one of my all time, like he's one of those artists that when he puts out a book, I'll buy it. I, I, it doesn't even matter what it's about. I'll buy the book because his pages are just going to be extraordinary. And every time I see his work, I just my, my interests are renewed. You know, I, I, I open his book and I just want to go read more comics. There's also some really cool um, online content if you're interested in that. Um, uh, if, so on YouTube, there's a there's a channel called um, Cartoonist Kayfabe which is really great to follow because they'll, they'll really get into analysis. Although, you know, some of it is a little more of, a, of an adult content, but um, they, they'll really analyze the, the aesthetic, the approach, and both of the, of the creators that are in, in sort of analyzing this work are themselves extraordinary artists. So, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in a process, you, you, you listen to the two of them analyze different works from the past, and, and they'll really break it down like, oh, it looks like this, they were using this kind of approach or these kind of tools. Um, oh, they, it looks in this page like they were using ink and they would scrape into it with a knife. Um, so that's, that's a great resource. Um, uh, also, uh, it, that is on, um, on YouTube, you can find it, Cartoonist Kayfabe. Yeah, uh, let's see, like, it's kind of weird to spell. So it's uh, Cartoonist. thing is like this case they I'm sure that if you just put that in it will uh oh I didn't I should have gone to, uh, to everyone <laughs> my apologies um right there we go so yeah um on YouTube cartoonist kayfabe is a, is a great um there's also um, some books um, that I'll show you. Just give me one second. Okay, so, okay, there, um, there is Will Eisner's, um, this one is called Expressive Anatomy for Comics and Narrative. And Will Eisner is one of the seminal, um, seminal creators. I mean, he is sort of credited with um, starting what are now known as graphic novels. There's this one called Graphic Storytelling and Visual Narrative, um, also published by Will Eisner. And there are examples of his own work where he'll break down the pages and analyze it, um, or, or other artists um, too, right? And Will Eisner was just an incredible creator. And then there's this one called Comics and Sequential Art, also by Will Eisner. And you can actually get the, um, I think the last time I bought these three, 
I, I got them used uh, in, in pretty good condition. And they, they are really wonderful. If, if you're interested, I would highly recommend these. Um, there's also this book I've had for a while by a guy named Gary Spencer M Milledge, uh, and it's called uh, Comic Book Design. Um, so actually like that, I guess you can see it better right there. <laughs> um, this one is, is also helpful. Now, if you're just kind of interested in general on the history of comics and, and in particularly in America, there's this book. It's called uh, America's Greatest Comic uh, Strip Artists. And it features everyone from Windsor McKay that we looked at earlier to Hal Foster, uh, people like Alex Raymond uh, and Milton Kniff. These are all sort of like, you know, the pantheon of American comics. And um, again, this book was, I bought a used one. So it, it was uh, fairly inexpensive. Um, here's a cover in case anybody's interested. Uh, it is by, let's see, uh, Richard Marshall. So there's some resources for you. Um, let's see, I can tell, are there any other uh, questions? So far, that is all the questions. That's it? Okay. All right. Oh, here's one. Do you have any non-American artists you enjoy? Oh yeah, absolutely. The greatest of them all, Mobius. There's <laughs> hands down, there's nobody like, there was nobody like Mobius. Um, and, you know, Europe has a very, very uh, long and proud tradition of comics. Uh, Mobius, no, it's uh, M-O-B, uh, just put in Jean Giraud, uh, Jean Giraud Mobius. Uh, it's M-O-B, I U S Mobius, um, yeah, there you go, Mobius, and um, yeah, Mobius. Uh, also, um, uh, if you can get your hands on M Asterix, which is a phenomenal by um, by Uderzo, it was a, a fr Franco-Italian collaboration, really beautiful artwork. Um, Belgium comics are really have a long-lasting tradition. Um, so yeah, there, there, there are several European artists that I, and I, I, one thing I'm not very familiar about um, is, is a, a manga or the Japanese artists. So fortunately, but I know that they as well have a very, there's so many um, really important artists um, who work in that medium there. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not that familiar with them right, uh, myself, but yeah, there are, this is, like I said, this is a great time for comics because you can find anything online. You know, when I was a kid, like you had to track down these out of print books that if <laughs> uh, it was really uh, hard to, to find. But even people like, uh, if you're interested in more kind of quirky, hopefully I don't offend him, but Dan Klaus uh, is, is an artist that, that um, is one of my favorites. Like his pages are absolutely incredible. Uh, that uh, C uh, C L O W E S Dan Klaus, just really extraordinary artist. Uh, both as a as as a in terms of the page layout, as well as his actual renderings. So his cartoons are just extraordinary. People are sharing lots of other ones in the, the chat. They're into. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so, so many, everyone. like I, I, you can probably see all the books behind me. So <laughs> I could just start reading down the, the list as we go, you know, Grant Morrison is a phenomenal writer, uh, Dan Klaus, um, Alan Moore, uh, Jamie Hewlett, as, as far as his, uh, as far as his um, illustrations go. Uh, really, uh, there's, there's so many. I, <laughs> I should have probably had more prepared for you in terms of artists. <laughs> All good. All right. Well, we have, we are at 1 p.m. now. So I'm going to go ahead and see if there's any other last minute questions coming in. Otherwise, um, thank you so much, Miha. It's always oh, just my, wonderful absolutely to my watch. Pleasure. Hey, I'm yeah, so we, excited. We always to, love watching you draw. And... I'm so excited to see that there's this many um, people that have interest in comics, you know, like I, 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 I'm, I love the medium so much. And it's, it's really great to see that, that there's, that you know desire for and the last thing i say is 
really just if you have a story you want to tell it's it's not it's not impossible just find a piece of paper put down some doodles and and just work on it seriously i mean when i did the comic we just self published it first because it was it, we just wanted to do it ourselves so anyone can do it Awesome. All right. Well, with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks again so much. Do and well, we'll everybody. Next Bye. month doing portraits, I believe. Yeah. Yes. That's it. <laughs> All right. We'll get the uh, registration link to anyone who registered. All right, everyone have a good one.